Hello, friends, and we are so glad you've joined us for our Sabbath School panel here at 3ABN. We have a huge lesson this quarter. In fact, huge in another sense, we actually have 14 lessons for this quarter. Ooh. Normally, we only have 13. That's right. But we have been given 14 lessons on the subject of life everlasting, mm -hmm. death, dying, and the future hope. And I'm kind of glad we have that extra lesson because this is an important topic. A lot of people ask questions about death and dying and what's going to happen after we die. And the Bible has answers, lots of answers. So it's a good thing we have that extra lesson because we're going to be looking at all of those answers. And we're so glad you've joined us. We have a great team here today, a great family team here at 3ABN. Uh, starting with myself, James Rafferty. And to my left, we have Shelley Quinn. I'm just so pleased to be here. It's always, it's so much fun to study and then to share with you. Amen, amen. And Pastor John Denzi? I have Tuesday's lesson and it has a very interesting title, Mysterious Ingratitude. Mm, okay. Yes. And Jill Morricone. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor James. Excited to be here on Wednesday. We look at the price of pride. All right, Price of Pride. And then finally, Pastor Ryan Day. Amen. I love Sabbath School panel. And I have mm. Thursday's lesson entitled, The Spread of Unbelief. Mm. Okay. So before we get started, Pastor, would you like to have prayer for us? Sure, absolutely. Our Father in heaven, Lord, Lord, we are so excited about this study because there's so much to learn mm. in regards to Everlasting, life everlasting, Lord. Mm -hmm. And we certainly want that life everlasting. And so, Father, we're asking for the Holy Spirit to be poured out upon this panel, uh, that each and every one of our thoughts and ideas are that in harmony with your word. And Lord, that each and every one of us, including our viewers, that we're all blessed and drawn to your truth. And of course, to the truth of the ultimate giver of life, Jesus mm -hmm. Christ. So we turn this time over to you and we ask this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. 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 So we're going to start our lesson with the title, Rebellion in a Perfect Universe. Mm. That's where we start for this week. And I have the Sabbath afternoon lesson and Sunday's lesson. The memory text for Sabbath afternoon is from Isaiah chapter 14 and verse 12. And it reads, How are you fallen from heaven, you star of the morning, son of dawn? You have been cut down to the earth, you who defeated the nations. And that's Isaiah 14, verse 12 from the New American Standard Version. You know, many thinkers, the quarterly goes on to say, have tried to explain the origin of evil. Some suggest that evil always has existed because in their view, good can be appreciated only in contrast to evil. Mm -hmm. Others believe that the world was created perfect, but somehow evil emerged. For example, in Greek mythology, evil started when the curious Pandora opened a sealed box out of which flew all the evils of the world. Of course, this myth, however, does not explain the origin of evil supposedly hidden in the box. Right? Ah, right. By contrast, the Bible teaches that our loving God is all powerful. He's perfect and that all he does must likewise be perfect, which includes how he created our world. The Bible then says that evil, or asks the question, how then could evil and sin appear in a perfect world? Well, according to Genesis chapter 3, the fall of Adam and Eve brought sin, it brought evil, and it brought death to this world. But that answer raises another issue. Even before the fall, evil had already existed, manifested by the serpent who deceived Eve in the garden. Mm. So hence, we need to go back even before the fall in order to understand and find the source or the origin of evil that so dominates our present world. So this is a great uh, introduction to our question or our theme on life everlasting because life everlasting has been removed from planet Earth. We face death, we face dying, we face sorrow, we face pain, we pay, face unsurety in relation to the future. Mm -hmm. And so we have to go back now and find out, well, where did that all come from? And what we find is it didn't just come, it did not just appear on this earth, it actually appeared before the creation of this world. It started in heaven. So Sunday's lesson begins with this title, Creation is an Expression of Love. Mm -hmm. Creation is an Expression of Love. Now, Nature in its present condition, the quarterly goes on to say, carries an ambiguous message that mingles both good and evil. You've got rose bushes that produce these beautiful, lovely, fragrant blossoms, but they also have harmful thorns, <laughs> right? Yeah. 
And we, we yeah. look at that, for example, they talk about the toucan, you know, this bird with this huge colorful beak, you know, it looks so beautiful or whatever, but with all its beauty, it also assaults the nests of other birds and eats their frail chicks. Mm. And then we've, we've got human beings who are capable of kindness in one moment and then viciousness and hatefulness, even violence in the next. Mm. So the quarterly goes on to say, no wonder in the parable of the wheat and the tares, the servants asked the field owner, sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? And of mm. course the owner replies and says, an enemy mm. has done this. That's right. So the Bible tells us in 1 John chapter 4, verses 8 and 16, that God is love. Yes. Yes. God is love. That's the bottom line mm. of the character of God. God isn't just loving. He doesn't just act loving. He doesn't just do loving things. God is actually love. That's the right. essence of who He is. That's, that's a definition of His very nature. God is love. And love, well, love involves freedom. In order to truly love, you have to be free to choose. If someone forces you to love them at the point of a gun, right? That's not gonna happen, right? You're not gonna really actually be loving someone if you're forced to love them. And, and freedom involves choice. Mm -hmm. And of course, choice involves risk. And risk, well, risk suggests consequences. I mean, what if you make a choice not to love? There's gonna be a consequence to that and yeah. that consequence could be negative. Yeah. And so there's the risk. So, so when you break love down, there's a basic foundation that you go through that leads us to recognize perhaps a God of love who truly is love, giving freedom to his created beings, took a risk, a chance that led to a consequence if that choice was against God mm -hmm. or against love. And that's basically what we see happening in our world today because love necessitates this freedom. And when we look at this, we are looking at a consequence to mm. choosing against God. Mm. Planet Earth, Adam and Eve, were made perfect in the image of God. They were placed in the Garden of Eden. They were given uh, access to everything God cr had created except for one thing. And that one thing was, of course, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so because they had this tree that they weren't supposed to access, they had, they had a revelation of love in freedom and choice. And also they had a revelation of consequence if they chose to partake of this tree, which as the story goes, as the biblical story goes, they did. And we received a consequence to choosing against God or against love. Now, the thing that I love about the whole picture that we see in the Bible is that God being love, understanding freedom, choice, and risk mm -hmm. laid at the foundation of the world a plan B. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's yeah. right. Because he is love, he's thinking down the road, what if? And we find several texts in the Bible, several powerful texts in the Bible that actually vindicate the idea that God is love in spite of sin. Let me just give you one of them. This one is uh, Shelley Quinn. This is your favorite Bible text or one of your favorite Bible texts. <laughs> this one is found in, in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 8. It says there, and this is in the context of the great final test that's coming on the whole world with the enforcement of worship, what we call the mark of the beast. And in the middle of that great controversy, that great uh, uh, test, we're told in verse 8, and all that dwell upon the earth will worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation mm -hmm. of the world. Amen. This is such a beautiful picture because it takes our eyes off the final test. It takes our eyes off everything the world is doing. It takes our eyes off uh, even, we don't even focus here on the book of life. The main focus here is this last phrase, mm -hmm. slain from the foundation of the world. What that phrase tells us is that God is love. That's right. Mm -hmm. That phrase tells us that God had a contingency plan. He had a backup plan for our rebellion. He, the, the, the very definition of his nature is established by the fact that from the foundation of the world, he said, you know what? I need to put this in place. Yeah. Now I want us to look at another verse. This one is found, three verses here, found in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 through 20. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 through 20. Peter here is speaking about the plan of salvation again, and he says, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold from your fain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood mm. of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. So here's that yeah. same symbol again that we found in Revelation 13, verse 8, the lamb. And then he goes on to say this in verse 20. He says, Who verily 
was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Foreordained, that's an interesting word. It's, it's really another word for predestined. Mm -hmm. And predestined is a fancy theological term for deciding ahead of time. God foreordained, He predestined, He decided ahead of time. Why did He decide ahead of time? Mm -hmm. Because He is love. That's right. And He knew that love means freedom, that freedom means choice, that choice brings risk, and risk means consequence. And we're going to break all of this down. There's going to be a lot more that we're going to cover in this, in this area. But he knew that and therefore he decided ahead of time, right? Just like if you live here in Southern Illinois mm -hmm. and you know what the weather's like here, any moment there can be a thunder shower, especially this time of the year. And so you decide ahead of time, I'm gonna put an umbrella in my car. Now you may never use that umbrella. You hope you don't have to use that umbrella, but there's a possibility you will have to use that umbrella, right? Mm -hmm. I was raised in London, England, and in London, England, you just walk around with, just everyone has umbrellas. They just walk with umbrellas, they carry umbrellas, <laughs> they have them in their purse, why? Because there's a lot of rain, it can come at any moment, and then it can be gone. Mm -hmm. God set up this contingency plan. We're gonna look at one more verse before I hand it over to Shelley in Job chapter 38, one through four. Now, I, the thing I love about Job is that it's a theodicy. It's a, it's a explanation, if you will. Theodicy is a fancy term for an explanation of God's character of love in an evil world. And Job is the first theodicy, the first explanation that we get in the mm. word of God. Mm. And Job is just completely um, destroyed his life, his kids, his wealth, his relationships, everything is just ransacked and he doesn't know who's done this to him. He thinks maybe it's God. And this is why the book of Job is so powerful because it brings the, pulls the curtains back and help us, helps us to see that Satan is really behind it all. Mm -hmm. And then God shows up toward the end of the book and God asks Job a number of questions and he begins in verse one of chapter 38 and he says, then the Lord answered Job out of the world when he said, who is this that darkens counsel with words without knowledge? Gird up now the loins of like your loins like a man and I will demand of thee and answer me. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the world? Declare it if you have understanding. <laughs> well, mm. where were we when God laid the foundations of the world? We were on his heart. Yeah. When, when God laid the foundations of the world, the God of love had this contingency mm. plan. Mm. And, he, and he laid aside this plan B just in case we chose to go in the direction of the knowledge of good and evil, just in case we were deceived by the devil. Job chapter 38 brings this out. Revelation chapter 13 verse 8 brings this out. 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 18 through 20 bring this out. All of these verses, all of these Bible verses speak to and, and, and support the foundation of 1 John chapter 4 verses 8 and 12 that God is indeed love. Amen. 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 Thank you, James. I'm Shelley Quinn and I have Monday's lesson free will, the basis for love. So I'll be reiterating a few of the things you said. God is love and his system mm. of governance is by the power of love. We know Satan works by the love of power, mm. but God works by the power of love. love he that. never coerces us, he never forces us. Love cannot be forced, it mm -hmm. would not be love. So. When you think about the sacred privilege, he created us with the choice of either accepting him or rejecting mm -hmm. him. This free will is a sacred privilege. Now, Satan abused his free will. He was Lucifer, the high angel. Then he came to earth and he deceived Eve mm -hmm. and Adam and Eve abused their free will and temporarily they declared independence from God and then they suffered the consequences of it. So it's something that I want to just say to you right now, if you have been acting independently of God, stop resisting His love. Mm -hmm. Choose yeah. to submit your life yes. to Him right now. And when you do, the interesting thing is we're going to be reading 1 John 4, verses 7 through 16, if we can get there. Mm. The quarterly asks an interesting question. How does this passage, 1 John 4, 7 through 16, what does this passage tell us about free will as a condition to cultivating love? Mm. So let's look at it. 1 John 4, 7, Beloved, 
Let us love one another for love is of God and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He's basically repeating a principle here from 1 John 3, 23, where he's already said, believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and love one another mm -hmm. as he gave us commandment. Mm -hmm. So one of the key characteristics of Christianity, if you are a Christian, then agape love, unconditional, unselfish love mm -hmm that prompts actions toward others, you're going to benefit them, whether they deserve it or not. Mm -hmm. But here's the beautiful thing. Romans 5.5 5 says, when we become a Christian, God pours his love into our hearts mm -hmm. That's right. by the Holy Spirit. Right. You know, I can't love God right. with all of my heart, soul, mind, and mm -hmm. strength. You can think you are, but I can't do that by my own power. I can't love others the way God wants me to. Mm -hmm. It has to be as He pours His essence into us. And I love what Second Peter 1, 3 through 4 says. He says that His divine nature is imparted to us. We become partakers of the divine nature and we escape the corruption that is in the world through lust. So when he becomes your father, when you accept him, God gives you new DNA. It's the divine nature acquired. So we choose by our free will to accept Christ as our savior and to accept this love that God pours into our heart. First John 4, 8 says, he who does not love does not love God or does not know God for God is love. Mm -hmm. You know what? If we don't have love in our hearts toward other human beings, mm. we're not born again. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How could you have the Holy Spirit in you and not be loving? So God is love. Agape is a word we're familiar with because it's uh, the New Testament word of unconditional love. Mm -hmm. But my favorite word in the entire Bible is Hesed. You can see it spelled C H E S E D or H E S E D. And what I love about this word, it's a covenant term mm -hmm. and it's used nearly 250 times. And you know what? We can't even translate it into a single mm -hmm. English word. What it means is loving kindness, steadfast love, faithfulness, mercy, goodness, devotion generosity, patience, and loyal love. 250 times it describes God's love. It's kind of like a combination of grace mm -hmm. and agape. So here's the thing. You said love is the essence of his being. Amen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it is the flame of his love that makes God liked. In 1 John 1, 5, mm -hmm. he said, God is light. There's no darkness right. in him. Mm -hmm. It's the flame of his love. Love is so pure, mm. God's love. He cannot sin mm. because love doesn't sin. Mm -hmm. So in 1 John 4, 9, it says, In this the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. Mm -hmm. So this God of ours, who is totally love, his wrath towards sin is actually motivated by his love. Mm. Mm. He doesn't like the consequences that sin brings. Mm -hmm. And God decided mm -hmm. before the, he created us mm -hmm. that he would come down, take on our flesh and become the person of Jesus Christ so that he could save us from the consequences of sin. First mm -hmm. John 4:10. in this is love. Here's the true definition of God's love for us. Not that we love God, but that he loved us mm -hmm. and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. He is the atonement, the covering. It is only because Jesus Christ, 1 John 1, 9 says that he died for the sins of the whole world. Your payment, your penalty for sin has been paid. 
Mm. All he's waiting is for you to accept it. Mm -hmm. He's satisfied the demands of God's wrath against sin. So 1 John 4, 11 says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. Right. We're to walk in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. Psalm 89, I believe it is, says righteousness goes before him mm. and makes his footsteps a path to follow. So 1 John 4, 12 says, no one has seen God at any time. But if we love one another, God abides in us and his love has been perfected in us. Mm. When we choose to open our hearts by faith, the indwelling spirit, if God is love, God, love is holy. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of love. When he is living in us, he brings our love to a maturity. Mm -hmm. and, and we can say, Lord, help me to love others the way you do. Right. One of my favorite scriptures other than Revelation 13 <laughs> 8, is 1 Thessalonians 3, 12 through 13. Mm. I love this. Now listen carefully. 1 Thessalonians 3.12 May the Lord make you increase and abound in love mm -hmm. to one another and to all just as we do to you. So who's doing the action here? The Lord. The Lord, mm -hmm. the Lord is causing you. He will cause you to be what He calls you to be. Mm -hmm. Amen. But then He goes on and He says, so that. Anytime you see that or so that, it's a purpose statement. Mm -hmm. So he has just said, may the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love mm -hmm. for this purpose so that he may establish your hearts mm -hmm. blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ mm -hmm. with all of his saints. Do you see what he's saying? Mm -hmm. As God causes us to abound mm -hmm. in love, mm -hmm. we increase in holiness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Love cannot mm -hmm. sin. That's what makes God holy. Mm -hmm. So then he says in 1 John 4, 13, by this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. When we have the spirit in us, we know that we're abiding in Christ. And I have to say this, 1 John 3, 24 is a good litmus test. Mm -hmm. 1 John 3, 24 says, He who keeps his commandments abides in him mm -hmm. and he in them. And by this, we know that he abides in us by the spirit he has given us. So 1 John 4, 16 says, We have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love. And he who abides in God, love, he who abides in love abides in in God and God in Him. Amen. 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 So really this life everlasting we're talking about starts right now, doesn't it? Amen. It starts here with Amen. the presence of God in our hearts. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Ever wish you could watch a 3 of Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3 com. A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. Hello, friends, and welcome back. We've just got started. Life Everlasting is the theme, rebellion, and its uh, origin is our subject for this week's lesson, and we're handing it over to Pastor John Dancy. Thank you, Pastor James. We move to Tuesday, and the title is Mysterious Ingratitude. What is this talking about? We have heard that God is love, and this passage that we are going to go to in Ezekiel chapter 20 takes us direct to heaven, a little behind the scenes as to what happened and how sin started in the universe. Mm -hmm. And here we have in the book of Ezekiel, uh, interesting to note that the lesson brings out that the book of Ezekiel was written in end time symbolic language. Mm -hmm. And in many instance, instances, Specific entities like persons, animals, and objects and local events are used to represent and describe broader cosmic 
relating to the universe and or historical realities. Mm. So when we go to Ezekiel chapter 28, I'd like you to take you first to verse 1. Notice how Ezekiel 28 verse 1 begins, The word of the Lord came to me again, saying, Son of man, say to the prince of Tyre, Thus says the Lord God, because your heart is lifted up, and you say, I am God. I sit in the seat of gods, in the midst of the seas. Yet you are a man <laughs> and not a God, though you set your heart as the heart of a God. This king that had this attitude becomes a symbol of the angel Lucifer. And as we will read, as we continue, you will notice that he is described as a covering cherub. He had the great privilege to be next to God's throne. Mm -hmm. And as we have heard, God is love. So God showed Lucifer and all of the angels perfect love, kindness mm -hmm. to them. There was really no excuse for what happened in Lucifer's heart. There was absolutely no reason for his rebellion. And the Bible uh, brings this out here that he Sin originated with him. Let's go to verse 11 and look at the details that helps us understand that we move away from a man to talking about the uh, angel Lucifer. Notice how it says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre, and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Can that really be said of any human being after sin has started? No, because of sin, all of us have suffered some kind of uh, defects. And this individual here, it says you were the seal of perfection. I mean, this perfection was such that uh, it, admirable, full of wisdom and per perfect in beauty. Now, I don't know, uh, you know, my wife is beautiful, but I... No, I can't say that she's perfect in beauty. Pretty close, I would say. She but you is. cannot say <laughs> perfect in beauty. So look at this. It says here that uh, in uh, the New King James, it says seal of perfection. The King James Version says sealest up, sealest up the sum. Mm -hmm. In other words, nothing more could be added to improve Lucifer. Mm -hmm. And full of wisdom. He didn't lack any wisdom. He was blessed with wisdom and perfect in beauty. No blemish, no defects at all. Mm -hmm. Ezekiel 28, 13 says, You were in Eden, the garden of God. Now here is where we begin to depart from the, the earthly man to Lucifer. Because you may remember, and we, let's go ahead and read the whole verse first, and then we'll go into the book of Genesis uh, quickly here. Uh, it says, you were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. The sardius, the to topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, the jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. Mm -hmm. Now, no human being has set foot in Eden after Adam and Eve sinned. Notice Genesis chapter 3, verse 24. So he drove out the man and he placed cherubim at the east of the Garden of Eden, and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. No human being has set foot in Eden after Adam and Eve were cast out. So this helps us to understand that we're not talking about a human being. We are talking about an angel. Notice how then it is uh, made crystal clear as we move to Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 14. You were the anointed cherub who covers. Mm -hmm. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked in, uh, back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. This is talking about an angel that had the great privilege to be next to God's throne. Mm -hmm. uh, a beautiful angel, full of wisdom, but somehow he allowed something to happen that should not have happened because God showed him perfect, pure, holy love. And now it is obvious that no human being at this point had gone to the mountain of God. This is talking about uh, eons ago, uh, years and years uh, ago. And it says, notice uh, Ezekiel 20, uh, 15, you were perfect in your ways from the day you were created and here is where the change comes, till iniquity was found in you. In other words, 
uh, from the day he was created, he was perfect, perfect, perfect. You could examine him up and down with microscopes or whatever you want to consider, and perfect. Oh, he's perfect. He's perfect in every way, perfect. But then it says, till iniquity was found in you. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that God put it there. Mm -hmm. It means that of his own, because he had a great gift, which we all have, which is freedom of choice, perfect love. God is perfect love, and He gave all His creatures freedom to choose whether to serve Him or not to serve Him. And it's interesting that as you look at the uh, Hebrew word that is uh, here, some was found, it's a word that means to find, to attain, to find, to secure. And I found this quote that I like to bring to you. It says, legal context often employs the passive verb matzah to find, to indicate that what was found was the result of a judicial process. Very interesting. Mm. Now, I had a vehicle, uh, uh, I'm not gonna mention the model or anything, but I was going, to, taking some classes, and in that, uh, in the class I was taking, there was a friend of mine, he was also a mechanic. And when my vehicle broke down, I said, hey, I'm having this trouble. Oh, I know what that is. Why don't you bring it over to the shop tomorrow and I'll fix it for you. I said, oh, he's going to give me a discount. He's a friend. <laughs> so anyway, we go to the mechanic <laughs> shop and there he puts the vehicle up and he says, come and take a look at this. See this side of the car? That was the driver's side. Notice the, the piece that we have here. It's one whole piece. Let's go to the other side. Look over here. It's not one whole piece. It's two pieces. Mm. This is called planned obsolescence. I said, what do you mean? The manufacturer designed this piece to break down after a certain amount of miles were traveled on this vehicle. This is planned obsolescence. Mm. That means the manufacturer designed the vehicle to go bad. God did not have any planned obsolescence in Lucifer. <laughs> he was perfect and, w and should have remained perfect if he had chosen mm. to be obedient. Mm. But he chose not to be obedient. He was not pre-programmed to fail. He was, mm -hmm. he was made perfect, yeah. but he chose to do wrong. Mm. Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 16 says, by the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you out as a profane thing out of the mountain of God, and I destroyed you, O covering cherub. This is put in the uh, past, but this is, not, this is a, a, a mistranslation. I will destroy you, is what it says in the King James Version. I will destroy you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. Your heart was lifted up, notice, was lift, lift, lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings that they may gaze at you. You defiled your sanctuaries mm -hmm. by the multitude of your iniquities, by the multitude of your trading. Therefore, I brought you, I brought fire from your midst. It devoured you. That's future. Mm -hmm. And it, it will turn you to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all who see you and who knew and who, all who knew you among the peoples will be astonished at you. You have become a horror and shall be no more forever. Mm. This is the future of this angel, Lucifer, that became the devil and Satan. Mm. Now, it's interesting to note that uh, when Moses was before God, after spending some time with him, he came away glowing. Mm. And uh, mm. he was glowing with the radiance of God. And we went back to the people of Israel, and the people said, Moses, put on some covering because you are so bright. Mm. And Lucifer had the privilege of receiving the radiance of God. And it may be that he, the, the, the beauty, that, the splendor that came from God was reflecting upon him. He began to say, hey, I am more beautiful than all <laughs> these other angels. So we have a situation here where this angel sinned, no excuse, no reason for it, chose to rebel, wanted to take God's place, mm. and that could not be. Mm -hmm. It is interesting, there's more that we could add to this, but our time is limited. But unfortunately, this mysterious ingratitude in Lucifer resulted in sin entering into the universe. Mm. Mm. Thank you so much, Pastor Johnny. Each one of you, what an incredible quarter that we will be looking at. You are in Ezekiel 28, which is about the origin of sin in heaven, which is to me a conundrum. How could sin even mm. enter a place right. that was holy, that was perfect? It's just amazing to me. I'm looking at Wednesday, which is the price of pride. And for that, we're going to Isaiah 14. Mm. Those are really the two scriptures, Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14, that talk about the origin of sin in heaven there with Lucifer. My name is Jill Morricone. I forgot to give my name, so my name's Jill. 
Um, uh, there's two before we get to Isaiah 14, there's two predominant themes or motifs that compete with each other. The lesson brought this out. We have God's kingdom and words like Salem, Mount Zion, mm. Jerusalem, New Jerusalem. Then we have Satan's kingdom and we have words like Babel or Babylon standing for confusion, standing in direct opposition to the authority of God and the authority of God's kingdom. We have the king of Babylon. Think about Nebuchadnezzar, symbol of pride and arrogance. The image, remember, he erected on the plain of Dora that was not just the head of gold, it was the entire body mm -hmm. of gold. Mm -hmm. God's people were called, as you study scripture, out of pagan Babylon to serve him in the promised land. We see Abram called out of Ur, the Chaldees, to go into the land of Canaan. We see at the end of the exile, God's people called out of Babylon to return to Jerusalem and rebuild Jerusalem. At the very end of time, we see God's people again being called out of end time Babylon. And eventually, we will live with him on Mount Zion and the new Jerusalem. Yes. So as we look at the price of pride, we see Babylon. Now you talked about the king of Tyre in Ezekiel 28. Mm. Isaiah 14 talks about the king of Babylon. Mm. It showcases the fall of the haughty and oppressive king of Babylon. That's in the first few verses. We won't read it, but it clearly prophesies the historical hardship of the coming Babylonian captivity. And then it predicts its reversal when the people would be allowed to go back home. And it talks about the tyrant king of Babylon and his death. But it has a dual application, not just literal Babylon. We're talking spiritual Babylon. And here's where we see Lucifer in heaven, that covering cherub that you talked about, Pastor Johnny. And we see his fall. We're in Isaiah 14. Pick it up in verse 12 how you are fallen from heaven. O Lucifer, Lucifer means shining one, son of dawn, son of the morning, how you were cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. It reminds me of Jesus speaking in Luke chapter 10, verse 18. And he said, I saw Satan fall like, what's that word? Lightning from heaven. We need, read the next couple of verses. We're in verse 13 and 14, Isaiah 12. Uh, Isaiah 14, 13 and 14. In these verses, we have what I call the five eyes of pride. Mm -hmm. I will occupy heaven. Mm -hmm. I will exercise authority. Mm -hmm. I will have all in subjection to me. Mm -hmm. I will possess God's glory. I will be as God. Now, it doesn't fit perfectly, but this is my analogy of those five eyes with an acronym with the word pride. So the first one, I will occupy heaven, is position. The first P of pride is position. We see this in verse 13. You have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. So Satan wanted position. He wanted to occupy heaven. The second, the R is rule. I will exercise authority. It says, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, wanting to rule over the angels, wanting that rulership. The next, the I, is idol. I will have all in subjection to me. I will sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. This is the position of power. This is the position of authority. This is where others would come and worship. He wanted to become the idol himself. Mm. The D is dazzle. I will possess God's glory. You see in verse 14, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. Mm. And the E is equality. I will be as God. It mm. says, I will be like the most high. Lucifer wanted not to be underneath God. He wanted to be equal with God. Mm -hmm. Now let's look at what is the price of pride? That is, after all, the title for my lesson. What is the price of pride? I came up with seven things, Pastor Ryan, that are the price of pride. Mm -hmm. And we're going to start at the end point and work backward. The price of pride is death. Mm -hmm. That's the end point. The price of pride is death. We see that in the next verse, Isaiah 14, verse 15. Yet, remember, Lucifer wanted to be exalted. He wanted to be high. He wanted people to worship him. He wanted authority. He wanted to be equal with God. But what happened? You shall be brought down to Sheol, mm -hmm. to the lowest depths of the pit. 
Pride is sin. Sin is pride. The origin of sin originated with pride and selfishness, self-seeking. Romans 6, 23 tells us very clearly the wages of sin is death. But that's not the only price of pride. That is the end result is death. But the second price of pride, we're kind of working backwards, is separation from God. Proverbs 16, verse 5. Everyone proud in heart is an abomination Mm. to the Lord. Wow. Wow. Mm. Pride separates us from God. It might not lead to death immediately. It will eventually, but it might not lead to death immediately, but it separates us from God. Number three, price of pride, it leads to the loss of reason. We see this in Nebuchadnezzar. Mm. What happened to him? Daniel chapter four, he said, is not this the great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty? And what happened because of that pride? He was driven from men and he became like a beast. Mm -hmm. The price of pride is the loss of reason. The fourth price of pride is loneliness. I don't know if you know any prideful people. We're all prideful in some fashion or another, and we want the Lord to eradicate that from our hearts and lives. But if you ever met someone who's really puffed up and high on themselves, they're not even any fun to be around, are they? Because you think, oh, why do you have to talk so much about yourself? Or why do you have to be so high on yourself? And so it's a lonely life because other people are naturally pushed away. The fifth price of pride is resistance from God himself. Mm. James 4, verse 6. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, wow. but he gives grace to the mm-hmm. humble. Opposition from God himself. Uh, number six, the sixth price of pride is contention with other people. Mm. Proverbs thirteen ten. by pride comes nothing but strife. So in other words, if you and I, If I hang on to pride in my life, it causes contention with the people around me. It causes God to resist me or to push back against me. It leads to loneliness. I could even lose my mind. It brings separation from God. And eventually it's going to lead to death. The last price of pride, number seven, is shame. Proverbs 11, 2. When pride comes, then comes shame. I am so glad that the Lord doesn't leave us in our pride. He doesn't leave us in our selfishness. He does not leave us in our sin. We could talk a long time on how the solution to pride and how we're to eradicate that. But I want to give you three quick points. First is to give God the credit. Jeremiah 9, 23 says, don't let the wise people glory in their wisdom. Don't let the strong people glory in their might. Don't let the rich people glory in their riches. Mm. Let him glory in this that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord. Amen. So give God the credit. Don't say, oh yeah, I came up with that idea. Oh yeah, I'm a really good pianist. (laughs) Oh yeah, I don't take credit. That's right. Give God the credit. Anything good is from God. Amen. Number two, practice servanthood. We won't look it up, but you can read Philippians chapter two, verses one through five, and it talks about God, Jesus, who was... uh, God in heaven, but did not think it robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself lower than the angels, lower than us as humanity. And he took upon him the form of a servant and he died for you and me. And not only died, he died the death on the cross. Practice servanthood in your family, in your workplace with other people. And finally, number three, behold Jesus. Mm. You know, when we look at other people, we might say, oh yeah, I'm kind of a kind person because this person over here maybe isn't so kind. That's no comparison. Mm -hmm. Isaiah, Isaiah chapter six, when he saw God for who he was, high and lifted up and pure and holy and lovely, he discovered, I am nothing in comparison to him. Mm -hmm. So don't be discouraged. Give God credit, practice servanthood, and always, at all times, look at Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you so much for that, Jill. All of you did a fantastic job really setting this, uh, the foundation for this study. I'm Ryan Day, and I have Thursday's lesson entitled The Spread of Unbelief. Okay, now we've kind of 
picked apart this situation dealing with Lucifer's pride and his fall. And I'm going to be kind of overlapping and touching a little bit on some of the things that you guys have in these passages. But uh, basically now we find ourselves in heaven and the lesson has taken us back to Revelation chapter 12 where we're looking at this great war mm. between Michael and his angels and of course the dragon and his angels. So let's go to Revelation chapter 12 and we're going to start reading there in verses 7 to 9. And so the Bible says very clearly, it says, And war broke out in heaven. Mm. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon and the dragon and his angels fought. But they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven mm. any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Mm -hmm. This is a, a, a definitely, a, you know, we, we, the word war is used here. And I always like to bring this out because, again, you know, my, my adolescent mind growing up reading this text and hearing it and, you know, hearing other people study on it and read about it. In my mind, I would always see this great Star Wars theme, you know, <laughs> where, you know, Satan's showing up with his, you know, heaven, you know, his, his heavenly sword and he's challenging Jesus to a sword fight to the death, you know, for the kingdom of, of heaven. Uh, but yet we know that, you know, uh, Lucifer, while he did some ignorant things and allowing sin to come into his heart, he was very wise, he was very intelligent. He's not about to challenge the king of the universe to a fight. Mm -hmm. So the very nature of this war, when you go to that word war there, it's the word polemos. That's where we get the concepts like, that's where we get our English words polemic and politics. Mm -hmm. uh, this was a war. This was, a, the nature of this war was not necessarily a violent combative style conflict, but rather it was a war of thought, idea, the manipulation of, of belief. And that's exactly what Lucifer was doing. His pride led him to now begin to spread lies mm -hmm. about the very character of God and to instill doubt into the hearts and minds of many of the other angels around. And you got to know that all of the angels had heard this. Had, Lucifer was able to reach all the angels. In other words, share this message, try to cast doubt into their hearts. But he was only able to convince one third of the angels of heaven mm -hmm. to turn against God. And so uh, let's go back. We, 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 we came from Ezekiel 28 earlier and also Isaiah 14. I just want to highlight something very interesting there. So let's go back to Ezekiel chapter 28. Mm -hmm. I'm going to read verses 12 through 17. And uh, Pastor, or Pastor Denzi did a fantastic job of breaking that down. But I just want to highlight a couple of things here. So back in Ezekiel 28, starting with verse 12, notice what the Bible says. It says, You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were, notice, you were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. The sardius, the topaz, the diamond, the barrel, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the turquoise, the emerald with gold. So, I mean, no one's more blinged out than Satan, right? He's, this brother is covered from head to toe. And he allows this by the time you get to verse, uh, verse 17, excuse me, no, verse... Uh, uh, where is it at? Where, where do I find myself at? Where it talks about his heart was lifted up because of his beauty. That's that was 17. verse 17. So your heart, it says, your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. So he allowed his beauty, uh, you know, and, and you can just imagine, you know, if, if there were mirrors in heaven, I don't know if there were, but if there were mirrors in heaven, you can imagine this beautiful brother looking at himself in the mirror going, man, that's a... Look at me. Look at, there's not another angel in heaven that looks as good as me. And it lifted up, it corrupted his heart to think, you know, I'm better than everyone else. In fact, it even led him to think, you know, who is God mm. to compete with me? Mm. But I find it interesting in, in, within the context of this battle that's happening in heaven, this war of thought and idea, the manipulation of the other angels' uh, thoughts that Lucifer is casting doubt into their mind and heart, God eventually has to bring about judgment upon him. And so notice there at the end of verse 17, it says, you corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. But notice this, it says, I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings that they might Be gaze at you. Now keep that in mind. Let's go to, back to Isaiah 14, mm. where, where uh, Jill just read from, did a fantastic job there. We're going to start back in verse 13. So Isaiah 14, verse 13. Uh, again, she brought out, for you have said in your heart, this is Lucifer, I, have I will ascend into the heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. Get, get the language here. On, uh, on the mount of congregation on the sides of the north. Do you realize ultimately what, what is happening here in heaven? You have Michael and his angels, the dragon and his angels. What, what has Satan done here? Mm. This is the first church split. Mm -hmm, 
the congregation. He split the congregation mm-hmm. because of his lies. And so it goes on to say, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. And then notice what it goes on to say. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit. And we often know in scripture that that word pit is, is referring to the earth. But notice what verse 16 says, similar to what we just read in Ezekiel 28. Those who see you will gaze at you. Mm. What does Ezekiel 28 say? Mm. Or there, there in verse 17. I cast you to the ground. I lay you before kings that they might gaze at you. So verse 16 there again in in Isaiah 14. Those who see you will gaze at you and consider you saying, is this the man who made the earth tremble, Mm -hmm. who shook kingdoms, who made the world as a wilderness and destroys it, destroyed its cities, who did not open the house of his prisoners? Mm -hmm. So God is saying, I'm declaring upon you now, Lucifer, there's coming a time in which, you know, I'm going to cast you down. In fact, we know. As we just read in Revelation uh, 12 there, that, you know, the dragon was cast out. He's cast out to the earth, this pit of the earth. Now the earth is his, it will become his new uh, stomping ground. And yet he says, I will lay you before kings and they will gaze at you. Mm-hmm. Now, ultimately, my friends, I have to ask here, you, we have to ask the question, why didn't God just kill Lucifer? Mm. You know, God sees everything, right? And he knows where this is going to go. We, we know that it's going to launch us into, you know, God sees this, that he sees it's going to launch us into thousands and thousands of years of, of just rebellion and strife and hurt and pain and mm-hmm. death and sorrow and despair. And it's just, you, could, you know, God's seeing all this. So people ask, why didn't God just, you know, just snuff him out and just mm-hmm. get rid of him? Well, there's, there's multiple reasons for that. The main reason I believe is obviously it's easier to kill a person than it is an idea. Mm. In this case, if God had killed Lucifer, had destroyed yeah. Lucifer, would it have strengthened the accusations that Lucifer had brought against mm-hmm. him or would it have completely done away with it? Right. Obviously, it would have strengthened it. So now God knows. He's looking down and he's thinking, oh, no. You know, he, he actually allowed, we're going to read in just a few moments, he actually informed Lucifer. Mm-hmm. what this was going to do, the path that this was going to take us down if he persisted in his rebellion. So Lucifer was aware, mm-hmm. but now we get to the point where now he has to be cast out. His angels, that's the consequence. They're mm-hmm. cast down to the earth. But here's the question. Uh, why didn't God ultimately kill him? Obviously because, you know, the, the, the accusations against him would have strengthened. It would have caused confusion among the hearts and minds of the angels and the universe. But I'm going to submit to you another answer is found in Deuteronomy chapter 19. Mm. Deuteronomy chapter 19, verses 16 to 18. Notice what the Bible says here. This is Deuteronomy chapter 19, verses 16 to 18. Powerful. This is coming from the Lord. It says, If a false witness rises against any man to testify against him of wrongdoing, then both men in the controversy shall stand before the Lord, before the priest and the judges who serve in those days, and the judges shall make careful inquiry. Mm. Okay, that's the first part of the verse there. Mm. Make careful inquiry. So what is it saying? Uh-huh. What, what's happening in heaven? You have how many sides in heaven? What's happening? You have two. Mm-hmm. You have God, you know, Michael and his angels, mm-hmm. and then you have Lucifer and his angels, mm-hmm. and they're warring against each other. And so it happens to be here that uh, the person who's put on the stand or who is being accused or who, who is being prosecuted, I guess you could say in this case, is the Lord. Mm-hmm. But he, the Lord also happens to be the judge. Mm-hmm. So the system almost looks rigged in the beginning, right? It's like, dude, you're coming against the judge. The judge is going to come against you. So in this case, what God establishes, the very principle in, in, in Deuteronomy 19, is there must be a third party. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I cast you, I let you before King. kings and priests mm-hmm. that they might gaze at you. Mm-hmm. Who is this third party? Awesome. Obviously it's us. But, but here's the thing. Uh, technically, in, in, the, in a judgment scenario, we would call this, we would call this third party what? Mm-hmm. Jurors. Mm-hmm. Jurors. Now get this. Uh, we are God's jury. And I just want to say here, don't miss jury duty. <laughs> don't miss jury duty. Uh, we're, we're all jurors and, and only jurors will be saved, my friend. So don't miss jury duty. But there are a few requirements for jurors, you know, uh, speaking in, in, in terms of, of the, uh, the system of law here. Uh, requirements for jurors, get this. They have to have little firsthand knowledge of the crime. Mm. Did Adam and Eve fit that, that bill? Sure. Yes. Where were they when all of this rebellion was happening in heaven? Right. They weren't even created yet, okay? So you have to have little first-hand knowledge of the crime. Number two, you must be law-abiding citizens. Mm. (laughs) I love that. You have to be law-abiding citizens. And number three, you have to have sound discernment, Mm. okay? Adam and Eve had that in their perfect state. Mm. And also, number four, they must not be swayed by public opinion. Mm. So now now Lucifer's being laid down here, and now Adam and Eve are created as this third party to help decide 
you know, on the issue. But if you're the devil and you want to try to manipulate the system and you want to try to get your way, because again, does the devil play, play with rules? Mm -hmm. Does he go with the rules? No, he's no. a rule breaker. He has no rules, right? What would you do if you're the Lucifer and you had access to the jury? You would actually probably bribe the jury, mm -hmm. but that's next week's lesson. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Great, Amen. great lesson. Amen. Every single one of you did really well. We've got a little bit of time left. And so we're going to hand it over to Shelly first for some closing thoughts. I'm just going to say God is love. Quit resisting his love. Mm. Just accept him and your life will be changed. Amen. Amen. I'm going to read from the lesson, The Truth About Angels, page 30. Listen to this. Sin is a mysterious, unexplainable thing. Mm. There was no reason for its existence. To seek, to explain it, is to seek to give it a reason for it, and that would be to justify it. Mm. Mm. Thank you so much. Uh, talking about the price of pride, Matthew 20, verse 28. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So that's our objective in life, is to serve others. Amen. Amen. Don't skip jury duty. Mm. Only jurors will be saved, and you and I have an, have an opportunity and a responsibility to vindicate the name and the character of God today, my friends. Mm -hmm. So don't skip jury duty. Amen, amen. Thank you, each one. Excellent, excellent insights. As you can see, we have an excellent lesson study for this whole quarter. Everlasting Life, there's going to be a lot of good insights going all the way back to sin and rebellion. Uh, we looked at all of the different aspects of God's love in relationship or in contrast to Satan as a rebel and where iniquity was, iniquity was found in him. Next week, we're going to be looking at death in a sinful world. Mm. We're going to be looking in more detail at the consequences of the choices that we've made. And again, we want to remember, as Shelley shared with us, that this emphasis is that God is love and we do not want to resist His love and that He has put in place a plan of redemption, a plan of salvation, Jesus Christ, the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So we're looking forward to continuing our study in Life Everlasting. Be sure and join us for our next week's lesson. Until then, God bless.